morning, Evangel. We are glad that you're here with us this morning. If you're in the lobby, grab a cup of coffee. The cafe is open again. Come on in. If you're here in the auditorium, if you're watching online, I invite you to stand up if you can. Stand up with me. We're going to get ready and spend some time worshiping the Lord. We are just glad that you are with us today. Welcome this morning. Welcome. I am believing that the Holy Spirit is going to move and God is going to speak to your life. I hope you are ready for what is going to happen today on Labor Day weekend. All right, Labor Day weekend. So today, here's what we're going to do as we get started. Just, I, I'm just going to ask you, this, while you're standing there, just begin to say, Lord, I'm going to, I want to focus my eyes and my attention, my spirit, my heart on you right now. Lord, I turn my attention and my focus on you. Lord, I put, it, I put down every distraction, the things that have happened this morning. And God, I look to you in this place right now. The Lord, over these next few moments, as we come and worship your name, as we hear from your word, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that you would just move in our lives today. I'm believing, church, that God is going to speak to you and move. I, I know that there are some that have carried issues and situations with you, and here's the time where you can put your eyes and your focus on him. So, God, we look to you, and we worship your name in all things today. In Jesus' name. Bye. 
can you say that this morning, that it is well with you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing. If that's true in your life, just lift your hands, lift your voice all over this room. Just begin to tell them, Lord, it is well with my soul. My eyes are on you today. My eyes are on you today. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Our eyes are on you today. Our eyes are on you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are on you today. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing that again. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. Lord, that's our heart's cry today, that through it all, our eyes are on you. Our eyes are forever on you. No matter the difficulty, no matter the situation that seems so big to us here, our eyes are on you, Lord. And it is well, it is well with my soul when my eyes are fixed on you. My eyes are fixed on you. So Lord, help us today that as we're facing difficulties, there may be one or two that that are struggling and they need this moment. I'm believing that your Holy Spirit is just speaking to them and saying, keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on me. Keep your ears listening to my voice keep your feet in step with me that's where we need to be today God that we are walking listening and watching you and when we do it truly is well with our soul it is well because God you love us and you care about us and you you help us in everything so thank you Lord thank you Lord Lord, I'm praying right now for those that are facing physical situations. There have been needs and situations that have come in and sickness and different things that people are facing. And I'm praying in the name of Jesus for their healing today. Lord, numerous requests have come in. And Lord, you know who they are. So we're believing for the healing in Jesus' name. Lord, the needs that have come in this past week for people facing relationship issues. And Lord, there have even been some financial situations. Lord, you know them. I'm believing for supernatural, supernatural movings by your Holy Spirit. Just you're doing great things. And I'm believing for it, Lord. Miracles, supernatural things. I'm believing for it, Lord. We're believing in you. We're keeping our eyes on you. Our eyes on you. One last time, can we sing it through it all? Through it all, my eyes are on you. As we close this time, just sing it one last time. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Jesus. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Yes. Through it all. Thank you, King, for your presence with us today. Thank you that we can can trust in you and you are with us and you love us so much. So over these next few moments, I am believing that you are going to continue to speak to our hearts through your word today. God, I am believing and have been praying this past week for everyone in attendance here today or watching online today that, Lord, you are going to do an amazing thing in their life. So God, we are ready to hear from you. We want to hear from your word, Lord. We have our ears ready, our spirits ready to listen because we want to hear more from you today. So thank you, King. We love you today and give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated, church.
He is here, and he's going to continue to speak to your heart as we move forward in the service today. Welcome to Evangel. We are glad that you're here. I've got to get out of the way, or they're going to hit me with that. So we are glad that you're with us. If you're watching online, welcome this morning. If you're here in the place, welcome to our Labor Day weekend. It is like now, uh, like the back in the past, it's like the last weekend of summer because there are a lot of students that are going back to school this week. So it's the last weekend. Sorry to bring up bad news for the students that have to go back to school. Some have already started, but uh, some are going back this week. So welcome to Evangel. We are glad that you're here. If you are a guest with us today, about six feet in front of you in the seat pocket, there is a card that says connect. I know you may have to reach for it, um, but if you wouldn't mind taking one of those cards, filling it out, you can stop by our info center on the way out. Um, we just love to have a record of your visit with us today. If you're online, you can go to our website, evangelwichita.org connect, and there's a place for you to connect with us there as well. Um, excited also that you guys are, are just doing amazing. You're walking in faithfulness and obedience and giving. Thank you for that. In the seat pocket, again, in front of you, there are cards. We have giving station or envelopes, excuse me. There are giving stations in the back as you leave. Um, but thank you for continuing to walk in obedience, giving God. We worship. We believe it's worship, giving back his tithe and then even going above and beyond offerings. So thank you for doing that. It's enabling us to continue, continue to do new things and things that we are excited about as we start the fall. So you're walking in obedience with your finances. It's allowing us to do new things in the fall that we are excited about. But last thing, if, again, if you're new if, online, it's evangelwichita.org slash give. You can go there. There's a kiosk in the back. i got to get everything out. There's kiosks. There's all the apps that you can give, so make yourself aware of all that stuff. But here's what I'm excited about that I wanted to get to. Some announcements that we have coming up. Some great opportunities for you and your family as we are kind of launching back into the fall and even starting some new things here at the church. I don't know what the slide looks like, but we have some new things starting next Sunday. Is that? There we go. Awesome. This is great. So starting next Sunday... Next Sunday, we are going to be launching some things, and I'm going to come back and talk about but we have Roots that are starting, um, Roots for Youth and Kids. We have a, a, our Book of Ephesians class that you want to check out, or Foundations of Our Faith that's going to be starting next Sunday morning. These are all start, well, excuse me, Roots starts at 8.45, the rest start at 9. Oh, excuse me, Foundations is the 20th. The Roots starts next week. Ephesians is happening next week. Foundations is the 20th. That's right, because the teacher said he couldn't be here. So that's my dad's teaching the foundation. So he's, it's the 20th. So he's somewhere in here. He's over there. All right. But I'm excited. Here's the deal. Listen, listen. This is, and then I got to, I got to stop. We, we've seen research, and this is what it says to us. Research says that if you engage with your Bible four, at least four times a week, Four times a week, it's the great, it will be the greatest impact in your spiritual growth and walk. That if you engage with your Bible, the Word of God, which we all would say is the most important thing, right? That's God's Word, absolute truth is what we have. But research has shown that if you engage with your Bible four times, now you can do more, but if you hit at least four times a week, then it's, gonna, it's the single greatest thing to allow you to grow in your relationship with God. So we are creating and, and moving forward with some programs that we are rolling out starting next Sunday to help you grow. We want to give you the tools to, in, to, to allow you to engage with your Bible during the week. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So this is why I'm excited. Roots is a program that you've heard us talk about. Uh, it was uh, Men and Women of Valor last year. We've kind of retooled it and are moving forward this, this, um, this se session. We're calling it Roots, and it's a biblical, Bible-based program that we are going to run for adults, youth, students, and, and children all at the same time. So if you have a family, you could have all three of you in an age-appropriate class on Sunday, and you'll be receiving the tools to work with your family during the week. Our goal, if you have a family, if you have students or kids, that you, during the week, that you don't just come on Sunday and get this and forget about it, but you are engaging with your family during the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You get what I'm saying? Every day of the week. Roots is designed to get you engaged in that process. So if you want to check it out, um, you, today is the last day that, to sign up for it. You can stop by in the, in the uh, lobby. 
and see my wife. She's right here. She'll be back at the info center. She would love to give you more information about Roots and get you involved next Sunday. It's starting. Now, the book of Ephesians, it's taught by Scott right here. And, and the second, second row, he's right here in this, I think it's a Nebraska shirt. I'm not sure. But um, Bible-based, walking through the book of Ephesians. See how our theme, we're walking you through, giving you tools in the Bible. We want you to learn what Scripture says and what it means to you. So Foundations of Our Faith is starting on the 20th. It'll be an eight-week class led by my dad, our, our pastor, senior pastor emeritus here at Evangel. He'll be leading it, and it's going through different topics each week. You can jump in when you want, find out. We'll get you the the weeks that are happening, talking about what are the things that are important and we believe. Why do we believe the things that we do? Why? So there have been a lot of questions about that. We want to help you understand. And that's a class design that you can kind of start at any point and, and move back and get into it. So starting the 13th for Roots next Sunday, the 20th for Foundations for Faith. Ephesians is going on now. You can join it. You want to be involved on Sunday mornings before. So it's going to be exciting. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to see what happens in this Roots class because I'm hearing the testimonies of the people who have come out of Valor last year, and it's just been amazing. So you don't want to miss it. It's going, going to be amazing. Okay, now, I think I have one more slide for, um, there you go. Financial Peace University is coming on Wednesday night, September 23rd. It's launching on September 23rd. If you have never taken Financial Peace or, or you're interested, this is a great nine-week course led by Dave Ramsey. Many of you have heard of this course, but it's a great way to figure out your finances and understand how you can get ahead with the finances you had. Biblical-based approach, Financial Peace University, coming on Wednesday, September 23rd. There is a, uh, an enrollment fee for that, but the information will, it, that the um, iPads will send you, you can sign up for all that stuff, but that's coming on Wednesday night, September 23rd. Also coming on the 23rd of when, our Wednesday nights. I don't know if we have a slide for all that. Not yet, but I'll give you a hint because you're here or you're watching too. So we have some other opportunities on Wednesday nights for adults that are coming. We have our students meeting. We have our kids. But starting on the 23rd, some more opportunities for you to engage and get involved. So we'll be talking more about See, we're getting a little excited around here about getting things going again in church. It's been a long time, it feels like, since we've been able to do some of these things. And we are excited about what God is going to do and how you can get involved. So be aware or be listening to all the things that are coming in the coming weeks. All right? You want to get involved in all of that. Now, today I'm excited as well because you get to hear from Pastor Michael. Okay, I thought people would clap right there, but they did Pastor Michael is going to be coming, so we are excited. Our executive pastor slash youth pastor, Michael Scott, is coming to speak to us today. That's why the pulpit, he likes this. I'm old school. He's old school. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, uh, so honored to be here speaking, and, and it's humbling every time I get to present the word, not just on a Sunday morning, but also Wednesday nights and youth and any other opportunities. But real quick, as we get started, how many of you have ever found yourself in a place or a situation where you felt completely unqualified, totally unqualified to be in that kind of position? Okay, I mean, I feel like it's most of us. Maybe you found yourself in a place that is just way over your head. I mean, a big one for me that many of you can relate with, just over 18 months ago, our daughter was born. And I remember being in the delivery room, and it was awesome. Everything went great. But that first night, she was born in the evening. That first night, some of you remember, is just crazy. You know, you have this, this baby that God has now entrusted to me and my wife, and, and I've never done this before. I mean, it's our first kid. I, I've never babysat. I was the youngest of three brothers. So I never really dealt with babies. I mean, we took classes. You know, we, we read the books. But once that moment happened, once our daughter was born, they handed her to me, and I'm just like, what do I do? Thankfully, that first evening, though, uh, if you're familiar with delivery rooms, the nurses come in, they check on you. Anytime the baby's crying for a while, the nurse comes in, is everything okay? And I'm like, no, the baby's crying, something's wrong. And then so the nurse comes, re-swaddles her and, and helps, you know, everything happen. And, and so that first evening, okay, I'm getting the hang of this. And, and if this is what life with the baby's going to be like, great. Anytime the baby cries, a nurse will walk in, everything will be taken care of. That's what life's going to be like now. And so the next day, we wake up. I, I was on that super uncomfortable dad 
Murphy bed that they have in these rooms, which is probably an upgrade for many of you older gentlemen that you know were on the couches or whatever in the hospital rooms. But uh, we wake up and 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 we're you know getting things ready. It's about the same as last evening. Baby cries, nurse comes in, doctor comes in for a checkup, all that normal stuff. And then it came into the afternoon and they said, "Hey, you guys can go home." And I was like, "Really?" <laughs> like. Do I have to take a test to make sure I know what I'm doing? Like, again, I've never done this before, and now you say I can actually take this human being home? Are you sure you want to do that? And my wife, I mean, she's an awesome mother, so I was like, okay, I trust you. And so we got in the car, loaded up, and I, I drove like a teenager who just got their permit for the very first time on the way home, 15 miles per hour on Kellogg, you know, cruising down, just so cautious because you now have precious cargo. But for that moment, I felt so unqualified for this new stage in my life. You know, maybe it's just God humbling me over and over again. But I look back on my life, on my past 31 years, and I constantly feel like I am unqualified to do something. I mean, even back in high school, I was asked to be our youth group's worship leader. There's a reason why I don't sing up here. I, my voice disqualifies me from being a worship leader, and yet I was asked to be in that position. Or even again in high school, I was on our high school drum line, and after my sophomore year, towards the end of my sophomore year, they asked me to be the section leader of our drum line, which may not sound like a huge deal to you, but I went to the largest high school in the state of Missouri. I mean, big marching band, huge drum line, and they were asking me at 15 years old, would I lead this group of mostly juniors and seniors? My age, I felt like, disqualified for, uh, me for that. Even into college, where without any campaigning, without really any effort, I was elected student body president, when there were far better leaders qualified across the college. And even now, as I mentioned, when I stand up to preach the word of God, whether it's on a Sunday morning, a Wednesday night in youth, whether it's when I speak to a public school's Bible club on Thursday mornings once a month or, or I have opportunities at camps or different things, I feel unqualified. I feel like my own faults, my own inadequacies disqualify me from preaching the gospel. Now, <laughs> I promise I'm not up here trying to humble brag and look at all the things I've done in my life. No, in, in fact, it's the exact opposite because I feel in this moment to be more vulnerable and to actually say, you know, I didn't feel qualified for any of it. But each one of us has been called by God to do something that we're unqualified to do. You see, with the chaos, with the uncertainty of our world today, not knowing what next month or even, let's be honest, next week, not knowing what it will look like, it's so easy just to stay in our lane, to stay in our comfort zone. Because anything more these days is overwhelming. Anything more risks our security, our, our comfort level. But I believe that today, especially through the uncertainty of our world, that God is looking for men and women, students and children, who he can not only work in, but work through. And as you'll see today, your past, your upbringing, your family, your situation, none of that disqualifies you when God is the one who calls. You see, thousands of years ago, in the midst of the worst of circumstances, God was working in and through an individual who, despite having a troubled past, was chosen to be a leader among God's people. To stand strong in the face of persecution. To, to prioritize God's will above his own. To follow the right path, even when everyone around him pushed back. And so for, for the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at the life of Moses. And how his life was saturated with a majestic revelation of God. And the more I look at Moses' life, the more I believe that he actually had a lot more in common with us than what we believe now, I'm pretty sure none of you have ever murdered someone. We'll see that happen in Moses' life. But outside of that, I feel like we can identify with Moses and his situation and his unqualification, you could say, for what God has called him to. And for those of you who love history, these next few weeks are for you. Because I love the history of Moses and the Egyptians in Exodus. For those of you who love stories that play out like an epic movie, this is for you. And for those of you who can identify with someone who had a crazy upbringing, 
For those of you who identify with somebody who messes up a lot and yet is still used by God to do incredible things, this is for you. Now, usually when, when someone thinks about Moses, get the picture of Moses in your head. If you're older, you probably think of Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, right? You know, let my people go. And he's sta- very epic, beard, everything. Now, if you're my age or younger, you probably think of the Prince of Egypt, that animated movie. So good, so good. But whatever that image of Moses is in your head, just, just begin to think about that. But there's so much more to his story than even what those movies can show. You see, Moses' story actually begins before he was born. The book of Exodus begins by saying that a new king, that they called that position in Egypt, they called it Pharaoh. So a new Pharaoh takes over who didn't know about Joseph, who didn't know about the story of how God used one of the sons of Jacob, who we also know as Israel. Uh, The new Pharaoh took over who didn't know about the sons of Jacob and Joseph who went and saved the nation of Israel. And all All this Pharaoh saw was that the Israelites, Jacob's descendants, God's chosen people, he saw that the Israelites were growing at this rapid pace that was outnumbering his people, the Egyptians. And Pharaoh believed that they needed to be controlled or they would take over. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves so that they can make their lives as miserable as possible. But even still, the promise God made to Abraham about how his descendants would outnumber the stars. It stood strong, and the Israelites continued to multiply. They continued to grow. So Pharaoh made a law that when an Israelite, also known as a Hebrew, when a Hebrew baby was born, if it was a female, she can live, but if it was a male, they had to kill the baby. But the Hebrew midwives who helped deliver the babies refused to do so, and and God blessed them, and the Israelites grew even more and more. Now, one of these boys born during this time was hidden for the first three months of his life. Now, knowing that she couldn't keep him safe, his mother put him in a basket and and set him in the Nile River to get away. While his older sister followed along the riverbanks and and kept watch just to see what would happen. And if you know the story, you know as the basket progressed further down the river, that Pharaoh's daughter was actually the one who saw the basket and felt sorry for the baby. And the And then as as Pharaoh's daughter pulled the baby out of the basket, the child's sister popped out of hiding and asked if Pharaoh's daughter wanted one of the Hebrew women to nurse and take care of the baby. And Pharaoh's daughter agreed. And what's so cool is that that little girl went and got her mother, the baby's actual mother, to come and take care of the child for Pharaoh's daughter. And she got paid for it, and, and it was great. I mean, already as a baby, we see God working in Moses' life. And once it was time to name the child, as Moses grew older, Pharaoh's daughter decided to name him Moses. So even from the beginning of his life, that we see that God's hand was already on this individual. But now, let's move ahead a little bit to adult Moses. And as we look through his life the next few weeks, next few weeks, let's not only look at how God was calling and walking with Moses, but also I want you to notice how the same God that calls and walks with Moses is the same God that calls and walks with us today. So let's look at Exodus chapter 2. We'll start in verse 11. It says this. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them hard at their labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian, and he hit him in the sand. And the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrews? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me just like you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. You see, this moment is so significant because it shows that by the time that Moses reached adulthood, he was While he was raised to be in the royal family, essentially, he had realized by this time that he was an Israelite. He was a Hebrew. Now, think about this because we often overlook this moment in his life that Moses had realized that he does not belong in this corrupt world that he was raised in. One of privilege at the cost of others. One of false idols. One of sinful desires. But instead, he begins to identify as one of God's chosen people at a price that would cost him his status in society. 
The author of Acts says it like this in chapter 7. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense, avenged him by killing the Egyptian. And Moses thought, get this, Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. Now, if you look closely at these passages, by this time, Moses was not only figuring out who he truly was, but also, I believe he was beginning his walk with God. And I believe he had already been called by God to be a part of the deliverance of the Israelites from the Egyptians. Because we saw right at the end of that passage in Acts, it says that Moses thought that the Hebrews would realize that God was using him, that God had called him to rescue them. But they didn't see it. However, Despite his calling, I believe that, like many other times that we'll see over the next few weeks with Moses, that he was taking matters into his own hands. Moses was taking matters into his own timing by taking the life of the Egyptian. You see, Moses was jumping in, believing that he could be Superman, believing that he could instantly make everything better. But taking justice into his own hands wasn't the plan that God had for Moses and the Israelites. So there's, as we look through his life today, there's a few key truths, key truths I want us to realize. And the first one is this, that when God calls, it may take a season of preparation. You see, you may feel like God has given you a glimpse of his plan or, or his purpose for your life. And yet you're wondering why it hasn't happened yet. Maybe you're thinking, God, you you called me to be a missionary, but I'm still here in Wichita because the door hasn't opened yet or God you you called me to do this certain job to be in this certain position so why do you have me where I am right now let me tell you church stop trying to take things into your own hands stop trying to take God's will and God's purpose into your own timing and embrace the season of preparation you see when word got around to Moses that Pharaoh uh, when word got around to Pharaoh that Moses had killed an Egyptian and Moses then got added to Egypt's most wanted list he began to leave and he fled the country he left Egypt and he, he headed towards an area called Midian and the Midianites were descendants of Abraham just like the Israelites but were through Abraham's second wife who he married after Sarah's death So Moses flees to Midian where he meets a priest and his daughters and he eventually marries one of them. And then he lives here for 40 years and and raises a family. Now for you students who either just started school or you're about to, let's do some quick math to get you ready for classes. Acts tells us that Moses was 40 years old when he visited his people and killed the Egyptians. Okay, 40 Then he flees and he spends 40 more years living in Midian and raising a family. 40 plus 40 is, all right, a couple of you got it. Thank you. So Moses is now over 80 years old at this point, and we haven't even got to the burning bush yet in his story. Exodus 3 verse 1 says this, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, who was the priest, a Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. You want to talk about a season of preparation? Some of you struggle when God says something one day and you're waiting two weeks for it. But Moses probably figured that since he killed a man, that he automatically disqualified himself from being used by God. And now he's a shepherd, not of his own sheep. No, he hadn't achieved that status and wealth of his own yet. He was watching over his father-in-law's sheep at 80 years old and yet God was using the season of shepherding another man's sheep in the desert to prepare Moses to shepherd God's sheep his chosen people the Israelites through the desert you see we have this advantage now we've we've seen the movies maybe you've read through Exodus we have this advantage of knowing what's coming up for Moses and how his life was about to change in just a few moments from now But can you imagine the mindset that Moses was in? Now, I'm sure he was satisfied now that he had a family. He had a job. He had a community to be a part of that accepted him. But I've got to believe that there was part of Moses that remembered God's calling to rescue the Israelites. But he's a wanted murderer. But now he's old. But now he has a family to provide for. He had a list of excuses. And yet that leads us to the second important truth for today. And that's this, that no matter your past, 
God has a plan and a purpose for you. You see, Moses had one of the most messed up lives you will ever see. Remember, he was supposed to be killed as a child, but instead was spared and floated down a river. He was picked up by royalty and yet raised by his biological Hebrew mother. Then when he was older and he was already attached to his real mother, he was separated from her and raised as someone else. And there he received the highest level of education in the entire nation in Pharaoh's household. But after growing up in the palace, he had an identity crisis at 40 years old. He killed a man, thinking that he was fulfilling God's purpose. And then after going on the run from his adopted grandfather, this is a whole soap opera movie right here. He comes across a priest And he marries one of his daughters and and lives in the desert. And he spends the next 40 years as a shepherd. But let me tell you that despite Moses' past and mistakes, despite his exile from everything he knew, and now despite his age, God still had a plan for Moses. And church, someone needs to hear this, and, and someone needs to realize this today, that God sees you, that God knows you, that God knows your past, that God knows your mistakes, that God knows your excuses, and yet he still has a plan and a purpose for each one of you in this room and online. You see, our culture may tell you otherwise. Our culture may say that because of your past, your future is canceled, that because of your sins and mistakes, you are no longer qualified to live out your purpose, but God sees your past. He sees your mistakes. He sees your history. And church, he says, I still choose you. But despite Moses' history and background, God calls him miraculously through a burning bush. And not only that, but God is calling him to do something incredible. You see, God has seen the misery of his people in Egypt. And he wants to rescue and lead them to a different place. So once again, God calls Moses though he's much older now. And he tells him to go. He tells him to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He tells him to move from this season of preparation into the plan and the purpose that Moses was destined to fill. But Moses obviously recalls his past, and he feels this deep sense of inadequacy for a calling of this magnitude. Remember, he feels unqualified. Exodus 3 says this. We pick up the story. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you, that when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, well, suppose I go to the Israelites, and and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? Then, Then what shall I tell them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am, and this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you, and this is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. You see, we have to realize that when he has called you to do something for him, Our third truth is that God will be with you. I know that seems so cliche. That seems so, oh, of course you're going to hear that in church this morning or whenever you're watching, that God will be with you. Of course. But church, it is so true. It is so true. We often overlook that God will be with you. We don't serve a God who leaves us high and dry after asking us to step out in faith. We don't serve a God who asks us to do something and doesn't provide. We don't serve a God We serve a God that when he calls you to it, he'll see you through it. And as you just saw in verses 14 and 15, one of the most powerful statements that God ever makes in the Bible, I am who I am. And what's powerful about this is that he is saying that he wants to be known as the God who is present and active. He didn't say, I was who I was, saying that he's the God who did great things in the past and you should only remember what happened back then. But by saying, I am who I am, he is saying that he is the God who does great things, not only to Moses, but he says for generation to generation to generation to generation to us that God is I am. Can you imagine what it would be like to be Moses in that circumstance? 
You're taking care of your sheep. You're minding your own business. And you see a bush caught on fire. I mean, pretty entertaining. We live in Kansas. You watch tornadoes from your front porch. So a bush that's on fire, we're going to stop and watch. And you think it's kind of cool, but then you realize the bush isn't burning up as the flames get bigger and bigger. And so you decide to check it out. You approach it, and then it starts talking. Now, that's crazy. But not only that, the voice is the voice of God. And in this moment, Moses has an incredible encounter with God. But he can't help but think about his past and what the Israelites would even think about him. Because think about this. His calling is to go back to the Israelites, supposed to be his people. But the Israelites know him as the man who was raised in Pharaoh's palace while they worked as slaves. He's known as the one who tried to help him help his people before, but ends up murdering somebody and they turned against him. Then not only that, how would Pharaoh react? What would they do to him? What would he do to a man demanding that the king of Egypt let all of his slaves go free? But God, knowing what Moses was wrestling with, says this in verse 18: The elders of Israel, they will listen to you. And then you and the elders are going to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand, and I will strike the Egyptian with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. So God is promising to give Moses favor with both the Israelites and Pharaoh. He's, he says it may take a while to win Pharaoh over. You will have trouble, but don't worry. In the end, he'll let you go. And I want you to understand that when God calls you to do something for him that, he, that is beyond what you're capable of doing on your own, that God will be the one to give you favor with those you need to have favor with. Proverbs 3 says this, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and men. You see, remain faithful to God. He will be the one who gives favor. Now, I believe one of the reasons Moses failed at rescuing the Israelites when he was younger was because he tried to put himself in a position of leadership on his own instead of trusting God, instead of allowing God to position him in God's timing. But let's fast forward just a little bit. We had the burning bush. Great. Let's fast forward a bit as we lead to one final thought for the day. Now, after Moses and God have their talks about God's plan for the Israelites in Egypt, Moses goes to Pharaoh and asks for him to let God's people go. Now, God had already told Moses that Pharaoh won't give in just yet. And because Moses went to Pharaoh demanding the freedom of the Israelites, Pharaoh instead made work even harder for the slaves. So now the Israelites, they get furious at Moses. And Moses begins to question God because the people that he was trying to save are now turning their backs on him. I mean, this isn't even in the message, but how many times does it seem like the people that turn their back on you are actually the ones who are supposed to be your people? But anyways, Exodus 5 says this. Moses returned to the Lord and said, why, Lord? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you have sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on his people. And you have not rescued your people at all. And so the final truth I want us to understand this morning from the life of Moses is this. That lack of immediate results doesn't mean a lack of God. You see, it's so easy to get discouraged when we don't get those instant results, right? We pray about something or maybe God promises something like he did with Moses. And when it doesn't happen right away, we think that God doesn't care. And we have two choices. We could either keep going or we could give up. Now, giving up's the easy answer. Moses could have easily given up. God called Moses to go in, rescue the Israelites, speak to Pharaoh. But things weren't going the way that he thought they should go. Giving up would have been the easy answer. For us, you prayed and God didn't answer. Or more likely, you prayed and God didn't answer the way you wanted him to. And because God didn't do things the way you thought they should happen, it appears that God doesn't care about you. So we give up. But when we push through, 
when we keep going, when we rely on the faithfulness of our God, when we put our trust in him and lean not on our own understanding, that's when our faith is stronger than any situation that we can ever encounter. You see, Moses had that moment of doubt. He wanted immediate results, but he wasn't seeing those answers. But for those of us who know what's about to happen for Moses and the Israelites, for those of us who know the next step of the story that we'll cover next week, how foolish would it have been for Moses to give up right now? As I mentioned earlier, Moses has a reputation that we'll see for wanting to do things his own way, which I know isn't a problem that any of you face. I know that it's okay. But Moses had this problem. And I am so glad, I'm so glad that God does things his way instead of our own. I am so glad that God didn't answer the prayers the way I thought they should be answered. Because there's no way I would be where God wanted me to be. See, just because God hasn't answered your prayer yet, doesn't mean he's not working. Lack of immediate results does not mean a lack of God. Now, as we wrap up, I, I realize in this first message of David, it would not make a good movie, everything I just preached, because we have not got to the plagues. We have not got to the parting of the Red Sea. Uh, we're not wandering through the desert. There's no pillar of fire or, or cloud or anything. We haven't got there yet. We haven't got to those miraculous moments. And I did this intentionally because I believe that Christians are too focused on waiting for their Red Sea moment, right? They're too focused waiting on God to do something big. They're waiting on some big miracle, and then they'll start listening to God, right? But they completely miss the intimacy of a daily walk with God. You see, for Moses, he wasn't ready for a Red Sea moment or even a burning bush when he was the prince of Egypt. He needed that time to develop his relationship with the Father. And church, it's in those close times, it's in that close relationship where that calling happens, where we spend time learning about God's faithfulness, knowing that he will be with us, and where we are in a season of preparation so that when those moments happen, when we are thrown into a situation, where we're thrown into a position where we are clearly unqualified, we know our foundation is in the one who called us. Now, church, this morning as, as we close, we've gone through these different truths that we find in Moses' story. And like I said, I believe that we identify with Moses more than what we realize. For some of you in this room, God has called you. He's put something in your heart. He's given you a plan and a purpose. And I don't know when that happened, but maybe you're still waiting on it. You're still waiting on God's calling to come to fruition. And you're discouraged. You don't know what to do, but let me tell you that you may be in a season of preparation. Embrace it. Embrace this moment of growth and what God has for you. And for some of you, you feel unqualified with what God has asked you to do. And I have found that for me at least, in a moment where I feel like it is above my head, that's where God wants me. Because I'm no longer relying on my own strength. I'm no longer relying on my own knowledge, on my own giftings, my own expertise. But instead, I rely on God and his strength and rely on God and his knowledge and his spirit to lead me each day. So church, if we could, let's bow our heads together. And I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. But let me first say, whether you're in this room or watching at home, that a relationship with our Father is the greatest thing ever. It doesn't promise that life will be great, that everything will go right, but it will give you a purpose. It will give you a hope. And it will give you everlasting life. And if you don't have a relationship with God, I invite you to come and be a part of our family. Be a part of the family of God. Trusting in Him. Putting our hope in Him. And we know we have that through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
that it's only through asking Jesus to be your Lord where you can have eternity with God in heaven. And if you haven't done that, I invite you to do that. If you're watching online, go to our website to Next Steps. You can find it all there as well. But also in this room, like I said, and watching at home, I believe that there are many of you who are in that season of preparation. It feels like you're in a season of limbo where you're in between what God has asked you to do and yet you haven't arrived yet. Don't try to rush that. Don't get ahead of God's timing and God's will and God's purpose, trusting in him. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for your goodness to us, your love and your mercy. And God, I pray for your people this morning, that you would just be with them, that you would encourage them. God, first of all, if if there's anyone who doesn't have a relationship with you, I pray that you would make yourself so real to them throughout this week. God, allow them to see what they are missing. And Father, for those who have a calling and a purpose, every single one of your children, God, I pray that you would encourage them today. Speak to them, whether they're in a scene of preparation, whether they are discouraged, feeling like you're not with them, or whether they feel like you're not answering their prayers. God, I pray that you would encourage and strengthen them today. May they look to the life of Moses and many other stories throughout Scripture of your faithfulness and your goodness to those who call themselves your children. So God, I pray for your church today, that you would use them, that you would be with them. God, use us to be a light in the darkness throughout this week. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you again next week. We'll continue on in the life of Moses. Have a good day.